I'm Dr. Mona Lisa Muchatuta. Hi, I'm Dr. Russ Horowitz. As discussed by our colleagues in previous lectures, COVID-19 is a novel illness that mainly causes respiratory symptoms in adults. Today, we'll be talking about COVID-19 in pediatric patients. After completion of this module, we would like for you to be able to identify COVID symptoms in pediatric patients, which may be different than seen in adults, define pediatric age groups, identify pediatric patients at high risk for severe COVID and be able to come up with clinical management of COVID in pediatric patients. Now, unlike adults that are treated the same regardless of age, children have different age groups in which they may be classified. Here are the age groups we'll be using in this talk. Neonates refer to people less than 28 days of life. Infants are children 29 days to two years old and all other pediatric patients are two years to 19 years old. Now, let's delve deeper into the particulars of how COVID manifests in children. So you will remember early in the pandemic, children were called silent spreaders. This came from a misconception that children could spread COVID, but wouldn't get sick themselves. We now understand that COVID may be contracted by all humans, regardless of age group, and this diagram shows interchangeable transmission of COVID-19 through all the age groups. Children aren't the main source of infection in communities. Young children are less likely than older children and adults to spread COVID. Now let us discuss symptoms of COVID-19 in children. Now you remember in adults, COVID-19 mainly causes respiratory illness. That may progress into life-threatening respiratory distress. In children, fever and abdominal symptoms are common COVID symptoms. Other anatomic symptoms of the body may also be affected, but to a much uh, lesser extent. The majority of pediatric patients with COVID-19 will have asymptomatic or mild courses, and these patients will usually recover at home with simply supportive care. However, some groups of children are at risk for severe symptoms, which may require admission for advanced interventions. When comparing adults and pediatric patients, you will notice adults are more likely to suffer from stereotypical symptoms of shortness of breath, cough, and fever. That is predominantly respiratory symptoms, as we mentioned earlier. In contrast, kids are more likely to present with fever and GI symptoms. These GI symptoms, including nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain, can be particularly bad and may be mistaken for appendicitis or other common abdominal pathologies in children. As in some adults, COVID infections in pediatric patients may have mild symptoms or no symptoms at all, as we discussed, resulting in misdiagnoses of infection in asymptomatic children and adult patients alike. Children often suffer from respiratory and GI illnesses. COVID symptoms overlap greatly with those of other traditional illnesses. Therefore, it's essential to have high index of suspicion for COVID when children become ill. We now know from adult lectures that adults with comorbidities are at high risk of severe COVID. We also know that most children are usually healthy and lack comorbidities. However, when children have any comorbidities, they are at increased risk for severe COVID illnesses, just as adults with comorbidities are. Kids who are at risk of serious infection include those who are less than a year of age and those with medical conditions, including things like asthma, diabetes, immunosuppression, and obesity. These comorbidities make the children at high risk, regardless of how old they are. Now, another special group that we would like to highlight as being high risk for COVID are newborns. However, it is important to remember that newborns are at increased risk to most common infections like pneumonia, bacteremia, and meningitis early in their lives, and now COVID as well. Standard fever workup for neonates should always include COVID testing. Mona, this is really a very important point. Remember that COVID infection can mimic other common illnesses in the neonatal phase. Even if COVID is suspected at the source of a febrile illness in this age group, strongly consider treating neonates empirically with broad spectrum antibiotics and investigate for COVID if testing is available. Now, let us discuss management of mild to moderate COVID symptoms. Remember, there is no cure for COVID-19 yet. 
As such, the mainstay of clinical management of COVID patients, adult or pediatric, is supportive, as you mentioned, Russ. This simply means there is no cure for the disease, but management of COVID illness may be tailored to the specific symptoms that a patient is experiencing. For instance, patients in respiratory distress are provided supplemental oxygen via nasal cannula or non-rebreather mask to a goal oxygen saturation of greater than 93%. Other modalities may include BiPAP, high flow or bubble CPAP, depending on the cooperation of the child and respiratory status of the patient. Another common symptom in kids with COVID is fever. Supportive management includes usage of antipyretics like paracetamol, acetaminophen, or ibuprofen to control fever, minimize discomfort, and reduce insensible losses. For high-risk patients, consider empiric antibiotics to cover for other common severe illnesses. GI symptoms are common in children with COVID and can result in dehydration, especially when they are unable to tolerate PO or have excessive fluid losses. These children may require IV hydration if they are unable to tolerate oral rehydration. Antiemetic medications, if available, should be administered to help reduce discomfort and allow for oral rehydration. Now, in considering all the symptoms pediatric patients may have, remember that most children will have mild symptoms and recover well at home. So, which children need to be admitted? Those with hypoxia and respiratory distress or tachypnea requiring supplemental oxygen need to be admitted to hospital. Other indications include patients who cannot drink or eat or are persistently vomiting. Severe or prolonged GI illnesses may result in dehydration and decline of hemodynamic status, necessitating admission for fluid hydration. Other indications for admission are signs of fever or shock. These patients require aggressive clinical management to monitor and prevent deterioration, especially in our high-risk pediatric patients. Now that we know which patients require admission, any patient with mild or moderate COVID symptoms that does not meet admission criteria mentioned earlier will likely recover and are safe to discharge home. The clinical picture may change. So here are some tips on what to instruct parents to look out for in their kids and when to seek medical help. That's correct, Mona. Parents uh, should bring their children back to the emergency department or hospital for a persistent fever greater than five days, increased work of breathing or tachypnea, decreased oral intake or excessive vomiting, and signs of dehydration, including skin tenting, no tears with crying, decreased wet diapers, and dry mucous membranes. We've covered a lot of material on how to approach and care for the pediatric COVID patient. Here are some key pearls. Remember, COVID in kids usually presents with fever and GI symptoms like vomiting and diarrhea. Pediatric patients have some respiratory symptoms, but they're usually not as severe. High risk pediatric patients like children less than one year old or kids with comorbidities are at risk for developing severe COVID. These are great points, Mona. Also remember that most pediatric patients have mild symptoms with COVID and recover at home. The majority of pediatric COVID admissions are secondary to dehydration, but some may be admitted because of respiratory distress. Fluid hydration, oxygen supplementation, and fever control are the mainstay management for the mild to moderate pediatric COVID patients. Thank you so much for your attention. We will discuss MISC approach and management in the next pediatric module.